we're glad um, everyone's here, but especially those of you who uh, maybe haven't been able to make it to in-person events and are uh, now able to come to, 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 to meet us and hear about stuff that uh, wouldn't have happened before this crazy new era. Yeah, silver lining. <laughs> So I think we're basically at six o'clock, so we'll get started for the people on the line. So welcome everybody to our virtual fireside chat and co-ownership with Gnome. Um, my name's Katie Kernahan and I'm the VP of Marketing at Addy. Addy is a startup on a mission to democratize real estate investing by enabling investing for as little as a dollar. So thanks for joining us today. I'd like to introduce Noam, our speaker today. Uh, he's a local Vancouver realtor and advisor to Coho BC, an organization helping to connect individuals interested in real estate co-ownership. Before we get started, for attendees on the line who have Addy accounts set up, you'll be entered to win a $50 wallet credit. All you need to do is sign up at addyinvest.com and put Noam Dolgan in the how did you hear about us field and you'll be entered into that draw. And then if you'd like to share anything uh, during this chat, here are the social media handles. So at Addy Invest and then Coho BC on Facebook. So let's get into it. Noam, welcome. Thank you um, for joining us. So before Thanks we get into it, um, why don't you give us a little update on the current housing market in Vancouver? Uh, yes, well, um, it's a, like much of the world, uh, everything is mostly on hold in the Vancouver market. Uh, and we're all waiting to see where and how the dust settles. Uh, what's interesting is the way basically unlike other crises in the past where we're even able to, to still transact real estate and just there's been financial issues, we're dealing with a lot of physical barriers to the ability to show properties, of course. Um, new rules around tenants and, and rights around getting into their spaces and just safety concerns. So basically the, the market took two weeks off and is just starting to get its feet around it now, uh, starting in with new virtual open houses uh, and things like that. I've got a new listing coming up this week in the West End, so that'll be interesting to, to experiment with, uh, with this new technology coming forward. And we're really seeing this with the numbers. I mean, the last 30 days in terms of number of sales is, depending on how you look at the numbers, 70 to 85% lower in sales numbers than you would have expected that we're, than we're in the 30 days previously or than we're in numbers of this time of year earlier um, in terms of active sales. And a lot of sales we're seeing are sales that were started uh, a while ago before, you know, before the... Uh, we were unable to get into property. So everything's a bit on hold. Um, you know, the interesting question is going to be, where does this take us? Is this going to be a, a blip? The, the, the market was strong in Metro Vancouver region recently. We were, we had been in a dip for the last you know, two years plus, and the last four months had been really robust for the market. And so there's a lot of fundamental reasons to think the market is strong. So if this is quick, should rebound quickly if this drags on and there's a cash crunch and people become desperate to sell uh, then the, the market should shift but for the moment we're on hold and uh, a interesting opportunity for people who are willing to get out there and navigate through the virtual open house tours and things like that because there certainly are buyer sellers who are desperate to find find buyers uh, and vice versa and buyers who need homes and all of a sudden very little is out there so right hopefully what we can make it work what uh, just out of curiosity what what technology are you using to experiment with like how are you getting creative with open houses uh well we're doing um the, a, there's a virtual tour online which has been around as a technology for a few years already um but beyond that we're doing uh open houses on both zoom and on facebook live so uh -huh. on sunday i'll be walking through the property and you can ask questions and i can take you into the closet or walk you down, well I can't take you to the gym right now because it's closed, but uh, walk you to the parkade uh, and try to do an interactive virtual showing. Uh, we do a set of 3D showings online. And in this case, the property is vacant and perpetually disinfected. So we just, uh, those properties we can still show and deal with. Right, and um, you mentioned you had a listing coming up. Have you had many people listing properties in the last little while or is it all on hold, hold? Uh, I mean, listings are definitely down. Um, I think you, unless you're desperate to sell, you don't want to bring people into your homes. Clients of mine who have tenanted properties can't sell because they can't, the tenants can, can demand 
aren't you know you can't force anyone into a tenant's home at the moment. Um, so you know we've seen listings down forty percent or so at the moment, but I think uh, yeah that seems even higher than I would have expected given the challenges that we're seeing. Right. Right. Okay, well, let's get into kind of the nitty gritty of what we're here to talk about, which is co-ownership. So for people on the line who maybe aren't as familiar with yourself and, and co-ownership, maybe you can give us a little background um, on yourself and co-housing, co-ownership, and what spawned Coho BC. I know you live it, um, a version of it yourself. Uh, yes, thank you. So, I mean, co-ownership is an old concept, and we'll talk about the various forms of it. Um, but you know, we can go back to the beginning of time when land was owned by families and clans um, and would be split by various generations um, ongoing. But in modern time, you know, families have owned farms and had multiple homes on land. Families have owned vacation properties together. Investors have owned investment properties together. Uh, and before the 1970s, before the, the, the Strata Act, it wasn't called that at the time, um, people would own shares in cooperative apartments um, or yeah, and these were the only ways to, to, to own these things. We didn't have a, a lot of money. So as a model, co-ownership goes way back and takes a variety uh, of, of forms. But in the modern age, what we're seeing is a really push to use co-ownership as a hack, uh, as a way of, of creating affordability, creating community, um, creating, you know, keeping families together in uh, an urban environment, which is more and more separated. Uh, so for myself, you say I'm living in, I mean, I live in a, a house with a laneway house and my father lives in the laneway house and we live in the main house. Um, and I have friends who share townhouses. Um, I have friends who shared condos when they were first getting to the market. I mean, this is something I think that once you, once you think about it, you realize you know people who have done a version of this. Um, I co-own investment properties with, with relatives and friends. Um, and when I got into real estate, it was definitely something people were asking me a lot about. Uh, my background before real estate is in sustainability and environmental education and consulting. So I was thinking a lot about community and about sustainability and higher density living. So I started writing about some of the opportunities in the Vancouver market for co-ownership. And so a lot of folks started approaching me and saying, okay, how can we make this work? Uh, and at the end of the day, there was two things that we needed to happen. We needed a large number of people looking to do this so that we could help provide resources and support and, and even maybe make couples come to help couples come together, et cetera. And we needed to pull together all the professionals who had some experience with this, who understood this concept so that we could guide everybody through the process from beginning to end and make it easy and not have it feel like a standalone reinvent the wheel process every time. And so that's what brought a number of us together to create Coho, uh, to serve a need that is growing definitely uh, in society, uh, and to help people through the process, help them find partners, teach people about this. We thank you all for coming to learn, uh, and show that it really is a viable uh, and more sustainable, more economically um, affordable, quote unquote, and, um, and more community, more socially kind of heartfelt and, and, and better for you. Uh, so it really does meet a lot of those demands and we think that it's it's gonna be a growing, a growing thing. We're seeing a lot more people ask about it. Yeah, I mean, I personally think it's a really cool opportunity for young people getting to markets such as myself who are typically locked out, um, looking at these alternative ways to get your foot in the door. So who do you typically see, um, you know, getting involved in these projects? Like who, who would you say is co-ownership story is for? Um, so it can be for anybody if your situation demands it. If you and a partner know that it could work for you, then we can make it work for you. But we can make the legalities and you know and find the house that, that fits your needs, uh, assuming it's out there. Uh, but the four groups we see this most commonly practiced by at the moment um, are first-time home buyers such as yourself looking to get into the market. Um, oftentimes to share, let's say, a two-bedroom or a three-bedroom instead of buying a one-bedroom. You know, in Vancouver, for example, you know, where one bedroom start at five hundred thousand, but a two-bedroom at seven hundred is clearly a much more reasonable point per person to get into. Uh, you see young folks sharing townhouses, as I said, where one person's on the ground floor and someone else is upstairs. Or uh, so that's one group is the twenty and thirty-some singles and couples coming in together. 
Um, you also see the singles and couples groups at different stages in life. So you see those groups forming in their 40s and 50s, um, folks uh, who, are, who feel like they wanna come together, they realize you know, they're a stage where they're looking longer term, the 20s and the 30s may be looking for a you know, three to five year first investment, get in the market, so, you know, take their equity and go. Whereas the, the, these next stage individuals are looking for a longer term, uh, you know, community and support. And then we see this really talked about a lot in the, the, the eldest age in, in society, um, the golden girls phenomenon we, we keep hearing about, uh, because it really builds that sense of support and community and ability to age in place um, and, you know, the alternative to so many of the other isolation condos or not so appealing seniors homes. Uh, so those three groups we're seeing that work with in kind of singles and couples. Um, mm -hmm. We're also seeing a lot with young families. So either single parents or couples with kids sharing, sharing housing so they can share resources, they can share childcare support, uh, et cetera. And uh, we can talk a lot about how that is helpful in general, but I think given what's happening right now around our world, it's easy to see how much an advantage it could be to have another family sharing with you and able to look after each other, and uh, especially parents with single kids who are going, the kids are going crazy. I've heard a lot of them, or you know, our, the two levels in a Vancouver special are saying, we're gonna be a bubble together, uh, et cetera. So you see that group a lot either uh, both in sharing spaces or these Vancouver specials or duplexes, these separate suites. Um, and then the, the, the last group really is, is families uh, of, of, of one type. So not separate families, but like my situation where my, my father and, and ourselves or two siblings who inherit a piece of land and develop it together for, for a duplex. So they each get their own land, but they are still living in conjunction. Um, so there's a, so that, those are the three the four main groups I like to say is young singles and couples, elder, older singles and couples, uh, young families, and intergenerational families. Um, but it, it happens in a variety of forms. As I mentioned, investors have been doing this for a long time, just as investment properties, and vacation properties, and other things. But for residential housing, those are the four groups we're seeing a lot of. Right, yeah, so it sounds like it, it truly could be any combination of, of people who want to build community together. Um, in terms of, like the structure you talked about, the different types of um, arrangements in terms of people living in, in houses together. Like what are some examples that you see for these shared spaces? So right off the bat, there's two major forms. One is with shared space and one is with shared land and maybe certain shared amenities or, or you know, resources, but you have separate kitchens, separate doors, separate, you know, feels like your own unit. Um, so that second one tends to be the more appealing and more common one. So you still have what would be a traditional private space. And I, I use the Vancouver Special or, or an Unshotified Duplex as an example. If you don't know the Vancouver Special, let's just Google search that quickly and look at the picture. It's that classic two-level suite with a full-level ground floor, you know, 1,000, 1,200 square feet, two or three bedroom on the ground, and then another 1,000, 1,200 square feet, three bedroom upstairs really set for two families to live in with a, with a high quality of life. Um, so each of you has your own kitchen, your own entrance, uh, et cetera, and you just share the land, you share the garage, um, you share ownership structure, and by doing that, for example, you can save a half duplex in East Vancouver, starts at about a million dollars, a Vancouver special, you know, for it starts with 1.6, I mean, they go lower, but for a decent one. So you're looking at, you know, a 20 to 30% discount over an equivalent product. And really all you do is you legally share the land and certain responsibilities. So that's version one. So you see that in Mega Specials, you see that in some of these multi-suited homes that would have been rental properties that now are being shared by multiple families. Um, there are duplexes built in the, in the 70s and 60s that were before stratification that are, that are co-owned. Um, so you see those being, people have separate housing, or like our situation, um, um, a new house with a laneway house, right? Two houses on one piece of land. You own the land together, but you each have your own space. The second style is with shared ownership, I'm sorry, shared space. So that would be the two bedroom suite that you're sharing together or a, a townhouse. And I like the level of three level townhouse with a kitchen in the middle. So each of you has an own private space 
one on the bottom, one on the top, and you share the main floor. Um, but these would be setups for senior adults living in a house together, each with their own wing, with an ensuite bathroom, a little sitting area, and a bedroom. And they share the living room, dining room, kitchen. Um, these would be setups with shared shared accommodations. Um, and those aren't for everybody. There's clearly another level you have to get past in terms of the willingness and the desire to live in community, not just co-own. Um, but we see these different types of products appealing to different people. Right. So you mentioned, obviously, there's some financial benefits to co-ownership, and you touched briefly on, um, you know, like childcare as an example as a benefit. What are some other benefits that you see um, for people who are participating in co-own? ownership sorry well the first thing to realize before saying that is that every basically everything is a co-ownership situation even when it's not co-ownership right when you buy into a strata you co-own and you know you have the the strata meeting and the council to help make decisions um, but you you give up some control when you buy a duplex generally you've got some neighbor right next to you and I always say to my clients make sure to do subject to meeting the neighbor and liking them because you're going to have to get along with them. You don't have strata documents and minutes to look at. You don't know the history of this building and how well it's being maintained and if they get along, if they're good people, if they play music at one in the morning and everyone's been complaining about it, right? So just buying, even when you buy a single family home, you have neighbors, right? So we, we don't live in isolation. And the beauty of co-ownership is that you can eliminate some of those uncertainty before you get in. You do know your partner before you get in. You have a mechanism in place to deal with disputes and you know, and, have, and deal with resolutions. Um, so it, in some ways, to, compared to buying into a regular half duplex or a small strata where you really don't have any, any information about it, you, you get to know your neighbor, you know, you know you like your neighbor, you know you're going to be able to solve problems with your neighbor you know, before you start. So that's, that's a big one. Um, again, shared values. How are you gonna use that shared space? Is the yard gonna be growing vegetables or for children running around. Um, there's some economic advantages, not just in terms of the outright purchase cost, but you know, are you gonna share a barbecue? Are you gonna share a lawnmower? Are you going to do pickups and drop-offs with kids if you're buying some, some of the same age and share babysitters or whatever other, other you know, trade-off on babysitters. Um, so there's emotional benefits from having community, there's economic benefits from having community, there's environmental benefits from having community. Um, and there's actually a big peace of mind because you know what you're getting into. You've been through a long process before you actually buy in together, um, which allows you to eliminate a lot of the uncertainty you get when you normally buy a house and you have no idea who your neighbor is going to be or what's going to be like. Mm -hmm. So what is the legal structure of a co-owned property? Like, how do you get around some of these things? As I said, co-ownership predate stratification. So basically, it's just mo more than one name on title. Uh, much like a married couple would often put a property in both their names, uh, two unrelated adults could put a pro property in both their names. Um, you know, a married couple would do joint tenancy where when one passes away, it, it, it moves over to the other. Um, in this case, you would want tenants in common. I think I got this right. Go talk to a lawyer to make sure I have this the right way. But um, where basically, you know, if one of you passes away, it goes to your estate. So you protect your rights in that way on title, where you own your shares separately, not together, like you would as a married couple. Um, but you could even do, you know, two married couples, and each couple would jointly own 50%. Uh, and then in common, they'd own, you know, the full thing. Uh, so you can structure it on title in, in a in number of ways. You can also to create legal entities, so um, you know corporations or co-op corporations, and then you can own shares in that corporation. Um, there are a number of, of legal structures to how to do it, um, but the most basic level is you just do it. You just both put your name on there, and you own it. And then the question comes down to how do you manage that ownership? And that's where a, what's called a partnership agreement or, uh, or a co-ownership agreement is essential. And this is a, a legal agreement that should be drawn up by a lawyer. I mean, there are models of them and questions to ask to help you formulate them on the internet, but we have what Coho's works with a number of lawyers who've got experience with this. Um, and they, you know, can help you ask the questions from the most mundane of, you know, who's mowing the lawn 
uh, and wh who's paying the bills to the much more complicated, which is when one of us needs to sell, what's the mechanism by which we, we exit? Um, and so you go through a process of creating that legal agreement. It outlines how much each of you owe, they own, how much each of you owe in terms of costs, um, and all those sort of questions. And then that becomes, if there's ever a dispute, that partnership agreement becomes what you can go to in the courts um, to fight over it if you have to. Um, but on paper, both of you are on title. Both of you would need to um, be on board to sell the whole property. Uh, both of you need to be on board to mortgage the property. And this is the big question, and I'm sure we'll get to this in your, in your questions. But if you want to get financing on the property, uh, the way Canadian law works currently is all title holders, all the names on, on title have to be on the financing. So you would share all financing uh, obligations in terms of the title, all you know, background responsibility. But again, your co-ownership agreement would say, I'm responsible for this portion, you're responsible for that portion. If I stop paying my, my fees, you know, there'll be a few months where you'll cover me with, you know, with this amount of interest rate based on the savings account that we have. But if I can't come with money in three months, then you can start to take shares away from me to cover the money until we sell. I mean, again, all this has been well thought out by the lawyers um, and is there in your partnership agreement when done right um, to protect your financial interest uh, in, in the property. Because that's, you know, the number one concern everybody has is their financing and is their exit strategy. And so, you know, talking about advantages earlier, financing can be a big advantage. I mean, this is, I've seen a number of people talking, you know, partnerships coming together where one person has the down payment and the other person has the good paying job. And so one person can get them into the house and the other person can qualify for the mortgage. And so by working together, they're able to, to you know, to make something happen. So again, financing can be a challenge or a liability or, or, or uh, but it also can be an opportunity if you find the right partner who complements your needs. Uh, and if you have down payments, you know, inheritance, but you're, if you don't have employment at the moment, find yourself someone who's got a good paying job, but has still got big student loans to pay off, you know, um, and you can really make that partnership work. Right. So typically people who are looking to engage in co-ownership, they're, they've already joined forces. They figured out a match for each other and then they go out and they find the property. Um, versus, you know, one person maybe finding a piece of land that they really like and, you know, in your case, developing and putting in a laneway and then, you know, retrofitting the person later, like what typically works best? Yeah, I mean, typically, well, the most common examples of this are people who have a partner already in mind, be it a friend, uh, another family they know, a member of their own family. Um, and those folks say, we want to live together, we're going to go out and shop around for a house together, uh, and then we can guide them through that process, both the buying of the house and again, the legal questions that they probably hadn't thought fully through. Um, there are other people who come to us who love the idea and want to get into the market and can't afford to get in the market and are looking for partners. Uh, and this is where a place like, like Addy could also come in because um, some of you are probably thinking of this for yourself, but some of you might be thinking of this as, as an investment opportunity. And so we simply have homeowners who are willing to manage a house, um, take care of all the, you know, the daily maintenance and, and looking after it and paying the bills and would even, you know, manage the rental of a basement suite, but don't have the down payment to get into the market that they would like, or don't have the qualifications on the mortgage. And so by partnering up with someone, maybe not even going to live on site, just an investor. Uh, and in fact, we hear a lot about that in a different form, like the bank of mom and dad people talk about, or, you know, or people will gain their first down payment uh, from an uncle or a friend on their house. And in my parents' generation, it was a few thousand dollars and it was a gift. But in our generation, it's $300,000 and you can't always gift that. If you have one kid living in Vancouver and another kid living in Regina, um, you know, you're gonna give one 300 and one 30, and then you gotta figure out how do you deal with that in your will. And so one option is to co-own your kid's property. Right? And then have take your rental income from the basement suite or from a portion of their rent, kind of a rent to own model where they own a portion of it and they buying back more over time. So be that with a family or, or an investor, bringing somebody in to say, you know, a colleague and saying, I want to buy a house. And so I want to buy a rental condo. 
Say, well, don't buy a rental condo at $500,000. Buy the basement suite in my house at $400,000. Mm-hmm. You'll get the same $2,000 a month rent, but I'll manage the whole thing for you, and it's a win-win. And now all of a sudden, you know, you've got $400,000, and you can go from buying an $800,000 condo yourself into, you know, or a $1 million duplex into a $1.4 million house or whatever it is you need to do to make that step. Right. And so it sounds like Coho can help with the matchmaking side of things. Right. Oh, so I was, yes, I was getting, getting just got distracted. So yeah, the other part is people who don't have partners. Uh, and so you come to us and you say, yeah, we need, we, we, we need to find somebody. And so we have a survey online uh, that we ask you to fill out and just tell us a little about yourself. And we'll try to find you somebody. Uh, but much better than that is, well, once we have them again, would be to come to some of our in-person events uh, and meet other folks. There's nothing like, hate to say it, there's nothing like an in-person meeting, especially for something like this. But um, find someone who has, you know, talk about when you're looking. Because there's a lot of questions you got to ask about to find the right partner. They have to be looking for the right neighborhood and the right price point and a complementary product to what you want, right? If you want a big house, then they need the, the laneway house. Or if you want it upstairs and they want the basement suites, or if you, like... All these things have to match in a, num- in a number of ways. The timeline has to match. They can't be looking for a two to three year quick flip if you're looking for a 10 to 15 year house. Um, they can't be someone who likes to have parties late at night if you're somebody who's really a quiet one and can't sleep at night. Whatever, all these things you're going to know in advance, which is great, but you want to so you get out there and meet people. So yeah, we, we have social events. We run tours and it allows people to meet, to meet each other. Uh, and we do some, some direct matchmaking services. Um, and uh, to this day, when we're building up our, our database and our ability to do that matchmaking, mostly working with folks who come in with partners. Um, but if you have ideas, you know, give me a call and we'll, uh, we'll try to make something work for you. Right. So mo- do most people do this sort of thing permanently or is it sort of a short term plan in order to launch yourself into getting a property of your own? You know, it, it depends on again, your stage and where you're at in life. I mean, most people, it's a medium term plan. It, it, you know, for a, for a short-term plan, it can be a little bit challenging. I mean, again, it can work in that stage where you're, the market is going like this and you can't afford to get in, but you want to get your foot in it. And so you jump, you jump in and you do something and the market goes up and then you, you move out. But, you know, there is just more complications and two people to balance and two sets. So it just feels like it's been, I feel like hard for people to do as a short-term move, except for, again, when the market was rising, you saw a lot of first-time home buyers jumping in together just to get into the, to the rising market. But does it have to be a forever home? Absolutely not. I mean, I think a lot of people go in with a five to 10 year time frame. You know, they say at this stage in my life, I have small kids and you have small kids. And for the next 10 years, we're going to all have kids and we're going to be professionals in Vancouver. And as much as I want to go travel the world, it's not about to happen. Um, and so I can commit to this, right? So they, so they're able to do that. You see that with the, the seniors, you know, they're at that stage where for them it's for life, but you know, they're, they're able to say for the next, you know, five to 15 years, I see myself aging in place here. Um, and, and, and such. So I think you go in with, with, um, generally a medium term time frame because if you want it to be your place for life and the other person, I mean, things, you know, stuff happens. Like, People divorce and people die and people move, you know, and jobs get lost. And so as much as you're, you plan for the best, you have to also plan for the worst. And so if you, if you really expect this to be the place you're, you're going to live the rest of your life, um, well, then you have to have a plan to find a new partner to, to buy in. And that's also part of this, this, this model here is to, to, to encourage people to do more of this to show that there's enough people out there that you can actually resell a property and find a buyer for it. And we're starting to see that on MLS. There was actually a property sold recently that had been bought by two friends 20 something years ago. And you know, one of them needed to move on and they put on MLS, it took six months to find the right buyer and they had to educate the right buyer. And, um, but eventually they found someone who was willing. And then, and the seller, the, the half who was left had to work in conjunction with, with the new buyer because they had to sign a new partnership agreement and they had to sign off on a new mortgage with the new, the new buyer. Um, but it's showing that that model, being able to sell your share, is possible. So it could be there forever. But most properties you see people trying to sell the share today have not been able to find the right buyer at the right time. And so you have to go in assuming that you're going to have to move on at some point. Um, 
And as long as you're there five, 10 years, it, it's economically makes sense and it's stage of life makes sense, et cetera. Um, but if you go in there thinking you're gonna be there forever, you might be disappointed when reality sets in. Right, and so I guess that's why those partnership agreements are super important and be really clear on what your expectations are for each other going in. Yeah, I mean, they really guide, I mean, they guide whatever you want to guide, but they guide three things. They guide the, the economics going in up front and daily ongoing, the management and maintenance you know, of the property and, and responsibility, and then kind of how you get along, how do you make decisions, how do you deal with conflict, and then the exit. The, you know, what do you do? Uh, and I like to talk about this whole process as, as a marriage. I mean, it's a marriage where you know it's going to end. I mean, it might, you know, who knows, it may, it may last forever, but you go into it with an expectation that it's, that it's for a certain stage. But it's like a marriage. You have to date to start. You date each other, and you date properties to find the right properties. And before you marry either the person or the property, you go through the engagement stage. You talk to a lawyer. You know, you, you, you plan the wedding. You, you open up your finances to each other. You talk about all of your, your, the best things about you and the worst things about you. Um, you get the prenup planned, and that's what the what the partnership agreement really is, right? It's, it's that it's a prenup, uh, and then you're ready to go and actually get married, and that's when you you with the realtor go and find the right property. You sign that partnership agreement with specifics around your property, um, and hopefully you're you live happily ever after, or you live for together as long in your relationship as you guys it works, and as long as you wanted it to work, uh, right. and then you move on. Uh, but it um, yeah, so that's what I. That's the importance of that of that partnership agreement is really it guides the entry and it guides the exit and it forces you to have the important questions there in the engagement stage mm -hmm. because it's too easy to just to, to jump in without asking those questions and then realizing you've gotten in bed with a gambler or someone with unstable employment you know but but you know that's why that's why you date yeah. that's why you ask the questions that makes a lot of sense so is this um would this be a good alternative for a rental property uh, in, so as I said, as an investor, there are good alternatives here for, for, for rental. I mean, first off, co-investing, allowing you to get out of the condo market and into multifamily homes is a way we've been seeing people do for a long time. As I said, I suggested the, the idea of investing in somebody's basement suite or investing in someone's laneway house, I think is a, is a nice, a nice idea. Um, and then, I mean, as an alternative, as for primary residents, as an alternative to putting your money into investment, uh, I mean, there's certainly advantages here. I mean, there's, I get asked all the time, what makes more sense economically in Vancouver, renting versus owning? Um, and, you know, I don't have a lot of money. Should I buy my first property or should I buy a rental property somewhere out in the suburbs, you know, a little bit cheaper? Um, and the truth is in Vancouver, the cost of, of ownership exceeds the cost of rent or of renting generally. Uh, and so, you know, if, if you're gonna own, it's because you really want your own place, you know, you want you don't want to be evicted, or you think the market's gonna go up, you know, we're at we're at a dip right now, and so you think it's gonna go up. So there's there are reasons to buy, but it's not, you know, the cost of ownership monthly is much higher than the cost of rental. When you do co-ownership, you can bring those numbers down to a pretty equal place where then considering you're putting money into principal every month on your mortgage, you're actually you know, doing better than you would be renting. So mm -hmm. if you've got a little nest egg and try to figure out how to make the best economic decision possible, co-ownership certainly can become an economic alternative to renting um, in a way that outright ownership can be very expensive for many people. Um, and then I guess- that answer that question? Yeah, and then I guess um, just there's also some tax benefits if you're if you make it your primary residence. Well, definitely, yeah. If you're going to own just one property, especially if you think you're buying uh, near the bottom of a market, it's best to, it's best for it to be your primary residence. Uh, and people ask all the time, can you co-own with an investor? How does that affect your primary residence, etc.? You can claim your primary residence ex exemption for whatever portion of the home you own. Mm -hmm. um, and there are other tax exemptions. We talk to a tax lawyer, this gets complicated, but there are other exemptions and specialty things for, you know, first time home buyers and, and, and government, you know, resident grants and other things like that. But again, you can claim your portion of um, down the road. So yeah, but from a big perspective, if an investor buys their 40% in the basement and you buy 60% in the top, 
your 60% is still considered a tax-free investment, even if that 40% is rented, um, especially because rent, it's owned by somebody else. Uh, you can make an argument that you didn't have any, any uh, income, any, any interest in the ownership of right. that. Right. Um, so let's just talk really quickly about financing. So is it difficult to you know, get financing for a property with this structure or banks willing to lend? In some ways, it's easier, right? The more people you put on title, the more people the, the bank has to go after in case you foreclose and the more uh, salaries they can pile up on top of each other to, to qualify you. Mm -hmm. So again, you've often seen this as uh, on paper where you know, one person is the owner, but they need five cousins and uncles and friends all on their title to just qualify for the mortgage. So those people are owners in, you know, in name only. And you see this a lot in the immigrant community um, where people will do that, they really wanna get in the market, so they'll put a bunch of names on title just to qualify for the mortgage. So you, know, you can go to any bank as two, three, four people and say, we'd like to get a mortgage and they'll, they'll add you up and go from there. There are specialty products slowly being created. Um, ben City has one called the Mixer Mortgage. That it's a bit, but it's a paper. It's a, it's a bit of a trick. It allows you to separate the mortgage on paper. So I'm responsible for 60% and you're responsible for 40%. And mine is going to be on a fixed mortgage. And yours is going to be on variable. And mine will be 25-year amortization. And yours will be 15-year amortization. Or whatever variation you want to do. But at the end of the day, the charge on title is still against all of you. So if one of you defaults or has probably a payment, they're going to come after the other one, you know, for the money. So it allows you to, to look at it on paper as separate and to pay it separately and to make separate decisions to some degree, but you still become mutually responsible uh, for the product. But no, getting the mortgage itself is, is not the difficulty. Again, it's about people's willingness to trust one another. Um, you know, you are protected, you're, you're protected by your asset, like any, like any real estate purchase, if you know if you put down twenty percent, then you have that twenty percent buffer by your asset first, and then if something goes wrong and the market has dropped beyond that buffer of your cash down, you know you're protected by your partnership agreement where you could go after your partner for lost money if they leave you on the hook. Um, but like, but like any real estate decision, like you need to make a smart, wise decision if you're going in, you know, and the market's t tanking, you know it. it could get you in trouble, um, but it, but you're protected. Yeah, but you have those two tools. You have your down payment and you have your legal agreement to protect you if there's a problem. And you, you, we don't hear about these problems. I mean, everyone's really afraid of them, and I'm sure they've happened occasionally. Um, but it's not like people are out there co-buying with people and then walking away and screwing them left, right, and center. This is not an epidemic. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so. Help me understand what the difference is between co-ownership and co-housing. Ah, uh, yes, co-housing is a great movement. Um, originated in Denmark, but it's now around the world, uh, and it's a strata model in Vancouver. So, at the end of the day, you own your your unit, your strata unit, um, in a apartment or townhouse complex. Um, but co-housing has community and sustainability uh, in mind in its design and development and orientation and its, and its events. Um, and it's usually done through a co-development mechanism when it's first set up. So by, by which I mean, um, you know, the goals around co-housing is they're usually built around courtyard and shared space. People live in smaller personal homes because they have a large communal kitchen, large shared living room type space, uh, teen lounges, work sheds, um, you know, other amenities or whatever it is for that, that community needs and chooses. Um, so you're able to live in higher density and you know your neighbors, you have communal meals a few times a week, uh, you put on events for each other, you know, teaching each other skills or, or whatever it might be. So it's a really nice way to both own your shares privately, um, but also be in community. Uh, unfortunately, there are very few of them at this stage um, in, in Metro Vancouver. Um, and so generally buying into one of these can be, can be difficult. Um, and to develop a new one is usually a seven year development plan. You have to come together with a team of you know, 15 to 20 
other serious buyers and hire a developer and a consultant and put together a community and build to your needs. Um, and it can be really satisfying, but it's a lot of work. Uh, and so you see a number of these initiatives popping up and a few of them have successfully gotten off the ground in Vancouver itself. We have one closing project that was built a number of years ago, a second one that's under construction at the moment, and a few more that are in other stages of development. Um, so yeah, so it's a, it's a lovely model of, of community and sustainability, um, and we should see a lot more of it, and I encourage folks to look at that. What I'm trying to do with co-ownership is kind of take that onto a smaller scale. So instead of needing 20 to 40 families to do a large scale community, you can do it with two to three families and you can do it under current zoning. Skip, skip the years of dealing with the city's development office, having to do land assembly and just put two or three families together into existing homes or into building a new house that suits your needs. So it's a smaller scale version of that. Excuse me. <coughs> Um, so no, you're talking so much. I've been uh, <laughs> off in isolation. I know you're doing an excellent job. Um, so, um, are you see like the, this? Obviously, is an advantage in cities like Vancouver where it's really expensive. Do you see co ownership in other markets, <laughs> in other countries? Uh, yes. I mean, unfortunately, the housing the housing crisis is hitting around the world. Um, but co-ownership is popping up all over the place. Uh, if you go to the Coho BC website, we have a resources page which has articles and I divide it into local, Canada and international. And you'll see articles from New Zealand and Australia, from Los Angeles and Chicago, from um, the UK. It's actually becoming, in the UK, it's become much more institutionalized. Uh, the government has what's called shared ownership. And in Canada, we actually recently, the King government recently announced a shared ownership program here as well. But you can buy homes that you own as little as 20 or 30 percent of, and the government or a nonprofit owns the other 60 plus percent or whatever. And then again, over time, you buy it back from them. So yeah, now we're seeing you know private people coming together and doing this um, all over the place, and we're seeing institutional pickup in countries across the planet. Uh, and, and, and yeah, you see articles from India and Singapore and you know, all over. Mm -hmm. And so given the current crisis with COVID, how do you think co-ownership will be impacted coming out of this? I mean, I think this speaks, to, will show a lot of us why this type of ownership, this type of housing is so vital. I mean, I think this, like more and more we realize the need for community, the need for support, right? And if you get sick right now, uh, and I used to live in New York, I have a lot of friends in New York, and I keep hearing these horror stories of, you know, like a couple with a small kid and they get sick and they're stuck in their apartment and they can't, neither of them can go out because they've gotten sick and they have this to toddler in tow and who's going to bring them food and how are they, how they affect themselves. Um, and I feel like, you know, a lot of us are realizing, okay, if we, didn't live in total isolation if we lived in small pods right we could uh more easily support one another emotionally physically uh health wise etc so i think that in general will become more important to people i, I suspect because they'll, they'll, they'll see what it's like to be alone to be trapped alone uh, and to be stuck having to go out on your own into a scary world um on your own so I think from, from that perspective, uh, it would certainly encourage it. Um, I mean, you know, I, I don't want to talk financial so much, but you know, I said it, this is a, an affordability hack. You know, it really does drop the price of ownership if you do it right, 30%. Uh, I think for a lot of people, it's going to be a hard time going forward. And I don't imagine the prices of real estate taking the same fall that people's salaries are going to take. So I think... This way again, people looking for affordability options to get into the market. Uh, so I think that uh, should should hopefully make this a, a more viable option. So, yeah, I think from both the the positives of what this is teaching us about you know the need for community and connection, and from the negatives, the financial negative and the isolation negatives, I think this should be a more should be seen as a, as a as a positive alternative for people on on all those fronts. 
Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see where it goes. And I mean, community is something that's really important to Addy as well. Like we're all about trying to figure out how to pull resources to help everyone get their foot in the market. So yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting times coming out of this for sure. Um, so we're gonna flip over to questions really shortly, but just before we do, um, if for resources or if people wanna contact you to get in touch, uh, cohobc.com and um, what about contact for, your, for yourself? Just reach out to the organization. Yeah, or you can email uh, gohobc at gmail.com or you can contact me directly, noam at noamdolgan.com or 604-254-2549. Just want to actually try to reach me and skip the back and forth email stage. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. I'm happy to talk about your, your situation. I'm happy to see if there's somebody in our, in our pool who, who's the right fit for you and just to kind of explain through the process. I also really want to encourage folks to check out uh, the Coho BC Guide. Uh, this was just put together this uh, winter in February, and it really talks through everything I've said and much more. It gives resources, and it lays out the entire process from beginning to end, what that dating stage looks like, what are the questions you would ask in a co-ownership agreement, uh, how does financing work, um, what are the types of houses that this works for? It goes into much more detail than we could do here. Uh, and it's, for, it's available for download on the resources page on Coho. Uh, so I definitely recommend people go to that. And yeah, and please ask us questions, sign up to our email so you can find out about our, our future events. Okay, awesome. So we'll flip it over to questions now while Steve's getting set up. Um, we do have another webinar uh, next Thursday. We're doing these every Thursday. So next Thursday is on the future of secondary markets. Uh, we'll be chatting with uh, Kelowna-based real estate developer, Andrew Gauthier, and we'll share a link to register for that when we circulate the recording for this one. Um, but if you have any questions, you can use the chat function on the Zoom. And Steve, um, I'll turn it over to you. Well, cool. thanks, Katie. Um, hey, Noam, there's uh, <laughs> been a handful of questions coming in, actually quite a few. Uh, and as I was listening, I would like, okay, I can cross that question off because you guys definitely uh, handled some of them. Um, a lot of those questions that were, um, that came in, a, a lot of them were around exit strategy, basically. If you were to summarize it, it just, it sounds good, but like, how do I get out of this? Um, and I think you've made it kind of clear that there, there is a way, but, um, yeah, there was lots of questions around that, but here, I mean, but, but I, I will say something about that. Cause I, I didn't really talk about what the exit strategy looks like. I talked about planning for it, but, um, you know, there's a number of this, you know, there's a runway, the exit, the exit runway, right? Cause when you actually want to go to sell, uh, when one of you wants to sell, both of you want to sell, it's easy. If one of you wants to sell and the other one wants, wants to stay, um, what, what's the, what's the process? And so what we talk about is the first step is basically trying to find someone to, to buy your share. Right. And that's, we we're building up that pool. Give me a call. Say, I've got a, a half a property. I'm looking to sell off. Do you have a buyer looking for this neighborhood and this price point and this timeline, etc. cetera, uh, and this product. So, you know, give yourself some time to find someone to buy out, to buy out the share. Uh, the second the second option, this can be concurrent or before um, or after, is give your partner a chance to buy out the share. Right? And this is people talk about the shotgun clause and other things like that. We don't like to use the shotgun clause. And I won't go into the details of why specifically you don't use a shotgun clause. But, but you create a mechanism. You hire a number of appraisers or a number of realtors to come in and find a full market, fair market value. And you give your, your partner the option to buy to buy you out. And then the third thing is that you then force a sale and you have a time frame for how quickly that'll be. So, so, you know, you as a seller are stuck. You can't sell. This whole process is going to take three to six months, whatever you decide when you go into the agreement up front. Um, so you can't sell like that out for any somebody, but the other person is protected. They know they can't have it sold like that underneath them. They have time to create a strategy. So those are the three options. You find a new investor, you sell to your partner, or you eventually go to market together on a, at a reasonable time frame that works for both of you. Awesome, very helpful. So maybe can we flip to the beginning? I know you you kind of mentioned it, but um, how would one start to find a co-owner? Like you mentioned, the, the sort of the, the dating process. How do you how do you how do you find other people that potentially would be a fit? I mean, most people do this again through their own social pool, right? Once they put a word, the word out there that they're 
looking to buy a half acre of a special, who do they know who's looking, who would be looking to buy a half duplex, but wants to buy in with them? All of a sudden, the, you, the word gets around. You have a few people who said, "Oh, that 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 might work for me," and you know, most of them don't pan out, but but one of them often does. Or you know, again, that's where a lot of time people in their twenties, like you know, I want, I'm thinking of buying a condo, but maybe I buy, you know, I can't really afford a condo. I'll be stuck in a little studio box. And anyone want to buy a two bedroom with me? I think we can be good roommates. And at that stage in life, you're used to roommates, you know, to each other. So that's where most people do it, or with family. But if you want our help, as I said, you're please give me a call, come to our events, fill out our survey, uh, and we will try to help connect you with a stranger who will not be a stranger after you dated them for a while. I mean, your wife was a stranger at one point, right? So, uh, or most people. Um, I hope they I hope they were. They better have been. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's, that's a good point. And I've, I've actually been to a few of your meetups, and I feel like that, besides reaching out to you, just showing up to some of your events in person, like, because the people that are there are obviously interested. Um, yeah, so it, it does kind of bring like-minded people together. So um, we were doing two sets of events before. We were doing kind of coffee meetups, learn about the thing, meet other people. And we were doing open house tours where you could see the kind of properties that would work for this uh, along the way. And hopefully when the world ba opens up back up, up again, we'll be uh, starting those up again as well. So please, yeah, sign up so you hear about them. Awesome. Um, okay, so here's a question about uh, apartment corporations um do, do you like does this work with them what do you know about them do you know anything about them <laughs> is i this know i emailed this question? <laughs> no I, it's mike actually asking but i had emailed you about it earlier and i was like oh this is timely <laughs> <laughs> um you're, you're you're getting a bit beyond my expertise i mean really my specialty here was really to take these larger concepts of the co-op uh and the housing corporations and the uh um, the undivided interest type of products that are out there um, and the co-housing and do it on a, on a micro scale. So do it in the single family. So I don't want, so the answer is I don't pretend to know enough. To answer. Cool. No problem. Um, this one says, can I convert my existing property into a co-ownership structure? Sure. I mean, anything can be a co-ownership structure. So it depends what you got. And if you can find someone who wants it and if you can value it in a way that works for both of you. So, you know, it, it depends on what's going on. If you've got a house with a suite, um, if the suite is livable, if it's really, you know, a, a rental suite only, um, then, well, you can, you can sell it off to an investor who would take it out for rental income. But, you know, again, the Vancouver Special or a house that's been lifted where the ground floor is quite nice or, you know, a three or four suite, sorry, a three or four level home, you know, where they're, they're all above grade. Yeah, you could sell off you know, a share in, 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 in the house that way. Um, we're starting to see people asking us for land to build laneway homes for themselves. So you could you know, sell off 20% of your lot and have someone build a laneway house in, in, in your back. Um, or if you're looking to age in your, you know, in your own home, let's say you're a retiree, your kids have left the house and you've got a four bedroom house, you know, go look for two or three other folks who might want to, to share it with you so you can actually age in place. Again, it's going to depend on what your product is, how it's valued. Um, certainly, the, the more affordable we can create it, the more likely we are to sell it. <laughs> um, but yeah, ab absolutely. We, you, you can work with an existing product or we can go out and find a product. Cool. Um, you mentioned earlier about if a handful of people get together, there's certain banks that play nice where someone can have a 20 year amortization, another person have 15 or 25 or, or whatever. But essentially at the end of the day, they're all on the same mortgage and responsible for it. Um, this person's question was basically to the next step of that. Does that mean um, it's more difficult to get car loans, credit cards, that kind of stuff? Because on your credit, it shows this much larger mortgage than you sort of are meant to be responsible for. Yes, unfortunately, yes. Um, so it can it can mess up other credit applications. You, know, you have to look at your own situation. Normally, they tell you clear your car loan before you get a mortgage, because you know, and then get the car loan after the mortgage. In this case, I often say get your mortgage, get your car loan first. Um, it'll cut down a lot on your ability to qualify for a mortgage, but hopefully, you and your partner do it together. So you have to look at your situation. But unfortunately, the answer is yes. Yeah. Cool. Um, how do you deal with bad apples in a co-living situation? Like, I guess first, is it an issue, which I'm assuming there's always some sort of issue at some point with, with certain 
arrangements, but how do you deal with it if, if it's, if it, if it does kind of go totally sideways? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the first advantage is that people who are looking for this type of situation are usually looking for it, not just because it's cheaper, but also because they want the community element. So you have a bit of a self-selection bias that eliminates some of those, um, you know, and, and the people are more likely to be willing to listen to, you know, critiques, uh, et cetera, than the, it's my land, I can do what I want with it attitude you, you often get from, from neighbors otherwise. Um, but yeah, you create a, a mechanism for, for dispute resolution. Uh, I mean, first you talk, you just, you know, decide how consensus is, is done. And then if you have to, you go to a couples counselor, really. Um, you know, it's, it's a relationship. It's, it's about finances and decision-making and shared responsibility. It's all the same things as it would be if you're fighting over children or your own, your own relationship. And um, most couples counselors uh, can handle it, but we also have, have some that uh, are excited about the housing challenge and <laughs> want to start working. Fortunately, we haven't had to refer anyone yet. We keep saying, but uh, but yeah, we do have counselors who we can send you to to help you through that process. Uh, and then at the end of the day, if it's, it's not working, you go to your exit strategy. Um, yeah, and sell the sell the property. Okay, so I'll, I'll ask you one last one before we uh, we wrap it up here. Um, what what's your number one piece of advice for someone con considering co ownership? Like where what's yeah what's that like one one thing that that would really matter? I mean, don't go into it lightheartedly. I mean, like you need to give it serious thought about what is your timeline, what are your goals, what are your objectives, what do you want in a partner, do you need someone who's similar to you or complementary to you, um, and just understand that you're if you to begin, it's a long, it's a process. I mean, I say that the co-housing may be a seven-year process, but it's it, it's not. I'm going to go out, I'm going to buy a property, and I'm going to be done. It's a much more complicated housing choice, housing style. You have to date the house and date the person. You have to form a legal agreement. Um, you have to discuss much more. So, you know, just go in knowing that it's a six-month process to, to find the partner and find the house. I mean, even with the partner, you know, to, to, add, to ask the questions. You know, maybe you can do it in three months, but to ask the questions and to understand the market. Um, but, that, you know, go out there right now. You know, I mean, I'd say go to open houses. You can't do that right now. But just with, with, now that you've been through this webinar, like you're going to look at homes in a new way because all of a sudden you're going to be like, oh, right, I can fit three nice families in here, right? Or look at a, a, a brand new house in Vancouver with a 2,000 square foot main house, an 800 square foot basement suite, and an 800 square foot laneway house. And you go... You know, for $2 million, that's actually a steal. Or, you know, in these sides, say $2.1 million, one point, you know, a million fifty for the main 2,000 square foot brand new house. You can't find anything like that. You know, uh, 600 for a laneway house, 800 square foot brand new standalone little house, totally unique product. And that leaves 450 for 800 square foot brand new rental suite, possibly two suites down there, bringing in $2,800 a month. You know, the investors are loving it. The person who's living in the laneway house gets a brand new product they couldn't get otherwise. The main person gets a house they can never afford. So you start seeing, all of a sudden, you start seeing the, the opportunities out there. So uh, enjoy that because it's fun. And then, uh, and then find yourself the right partner and then give me a call. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much. This was been, uh, has been very, uh, very helpful. Um, I just want to make sure we're on time because I know everybody's backgrounds are about to get really loud with the seven o'clock clapping and cheering. My kids are already gone outside um, waiting for it. But uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for hosting this. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Noam. And um, yeah, tune in next Thursday for our next one on secondary markets uh, with Andrew Gaucher. We'll send the link around. Um, once again, Noam, thanks so much. And we'll also circulate this recording. So enjoy Good the rest night, of the Thanks. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.